In high seas or calm, both opportunity and risk lurk just below the surface. Answers require in-depth analysis. Welcome to Blackfin Group's Shark Cage podcast, where experts dip below the surface of important industry issues in search of hidden opportunities. Good day, folks, and welcome to the Shark Cage Blackfin's podcast series. My name is Keith Kemp, President and CEO of Blackfin. I will be your host today. First, a special shout out to all Blackfin's preferred partners, Loan Pass, Mortgage Vice, Constellation Mortgage Solutions, IE Emergent, FlowFi, and Cloud Verga, and really so many more preferred partners, uh, all doing absolutely great things for the industry. Uh, second, a shameless plug for Blackfin. We are the industry's best resource for everything and anything you need uh, in mortgage banking. Folks, nobody really knows the industry more than Blackfin. Uh, from top to bottom. So anything we can help you out with, let us know. All right. So today, please join me in welcoming my colleague here at Blackfin, Michael Harris. Michael's partner and managing director of our servicing and default servicing consulting practice of Blackfin. Michael, welcome to the Shark Cage. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Keith. I really appreciate uh, being here and I'm very excited. Cool. We're going to have some fun discussion today. But before we get into today's discussion around the current state of ser servicing and default servicing, let me take a minute, folks, and introduce you to Michael and highlight all the amazing things that he, that you've done, Michael, in the industry these last several decades. Uh, frankly, it, it'll help people realize you kind of know what you're talking about when it comes to today's discussion on, on, on default servicing and the state of servicing. Michael has over 20 years experience as senior executive in default servicing and mortgage servicing. Uh, he, he and his team uh, are subject matter experts in all things around strategy and servicing, investor relations, process, compliance requirements, Fannie Mae technology, effective servicing, uh, staffing strategies for servicing and default servicing, all the ebb and flow that takes place there based on industry trends. Prior to Blackfin, Michael was the president and CEO of Genic Asset Management, specialized in default servicing. He's led default servicing asset management and technology companies and has proven leadership skills and a track record of managing superior operational performance while maintaining an innovative growth and productivity and quality. Over the years, Michael has really developed a diversified mortgage service background, including developing the pilot outsourced management programs for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD, as well as working at, uh, with the top mortgage servicing and capital markets organizations. Uh, he's a Six Sigma black belt uh, strategic leader with ability to apply qualitative and quantitative analytics to really ensuring maximum servicing and uh, uh, default servicing results. Uh, Michael lives in Orange County with his family, he's an active member of his community, do miss being in the Orange County area there with you, Michael, but uh, one of these days, maybe we'll get you to Colorado uh, to, to be able to be hubbed out of here. So, uh, Michael, it's really cool to have you and, and look forward to today's discussion. So let me go ahead and jump into kind of our, our my first question, which is really based on the current state of servicing. Um, so let me start by asking you, and so our listeners can have a basic understanding of what's going on in the servicing and mortgage servicing space. Michael, what are some of the silent trends that are creeping up? What is the current state of mortgage servicing, default servicing? What does it look like the next six to nine months? What do you see in your crystal ball? Yes, Keith, I think that, you know, some of the things that we are talking about, you and I have talked about, as well as my conversations with my uh, fellow partners in the industries, is really talking about kind of um, these shadow indicators uh, related to default trends and allow me to explain. Um, as we all know, originations are down as it relates to uh, mortgage starts, uh, which is one component, but we look at what is in the pipeline for default, specifically for closure. So let's take a step back in time and look at prior to the pandemic, where we had a fairly significant amount of foreclosures starting to creep up, particularly uh, in certain states, but not only that, before that we had defaults start to rise. With the pandemic, we had a significant amount of obviously moratorium initiations where we had foreclosure default um, halts or stoppages. Those are still out there. So when you see right now 
foreclosure rates, those are all new foreclosure starts, which are starting to creep up a little bit, as well as delinquencies and defaults. But the real telling tale is there are a tremendous amount of foreclosures, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, foreclosures that had already been started, that had been halted, that are now being put back into play. And that wow. quote unquote shadow inventory is something to be concerning because it's going to have an impact on the ability for lenders and mortgage servicers to manage their inventory. So as we see def delinquencies and default to creep up, we also have this glut of for of properties in foreclosure and specifically eviction in foreclosure staying there and all these moratoriums are now expiring. Uh, definitely going to impact on resource allocation and the ability for lenders and services to manage those activities. The other indicators I see uh, in talking it through is that we have a tremendous amount of um, FHA uh, loans that are going delinquent and we also have conventional loans that were adjustable that are going to start to adjust with the interest rate increases that we're seeing, even at their current rate, if they even do not increase over the next 12 months, we're gonna have a, um, a significant impact on the borrower as it relates to being able to manage their uh, monthly payment as those loans adjust. Very concerning about that. Uh, one of the reasons we're having this conversation, Keith, is that we want to talk to servicers, we want to talk to lenders, we want to talk to those in the industry. How are they going to manage the new influx default activity, mm -hmm. considering or assuming that they really haven't focused on this in the last 10 years? Uh, one of the things I will say is that nobody expects that default, delinquency default foreclosure, REO, will ever hit the marks that we had in 2010, I'm sorry, 2007 to 2011, 12. Um, I, you know, that was an anomaly. I think that most lenders, servicers do have their loss mitigation, forbearance, modification programs, uh, very much up to speed, very sophisticated compared to what it was 10, 12 years ago. However, I still see uh, um, an impact and an influx of those types of activities. And again, Let's you know. Let's get in, uh, in partnership with servicers and uh, lenders to to help them manage these activities. That's really insightful, and I I know I'm going to go completely off script on you here, Michael. But in in that probably was a good experience, or at least preparation. You know, in every bad, there's good, right? So maybe you know the bad of of what we dealt with when it came to COVID and the forbearances and that all that getting structured, like you said, in, in, in pretty good shape. How would you say that what's ahead of us really compares to uh, uh, back in 2008, 2010, 2011, and the mess that we had to deal with there? What are the significant changes? Is it that lenders have a little bit better lead time uh, to or servicers and sub servicers that have a little bit better lead time now to prepare accordingly, as opposed to how uh, 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 sudden and abrasive it was back in 2010, 2011. So let's go back to the origination. Um, it really starts with the, the types of loans that are being produced and being originated. It's significantly different, as we all know, compared back to 2003 to 2007. Um, obviously, the more to, um, sorry, the uh, government regulations as it relates to the types of loans, uh, borrower qualifications, et cetera, greatly reduce uh, the type of um, of uh, questionable loans and questionable qualification of borrowers for these loans as a comparative back to the um, early 2000s. So that in and of itself helps the process. The other is is that, uh, with the compliance regulations and requirements that have been in place for the last 12, 13 years, obviously servicers and lenders are required to maintain certain types of levels of compliance as it relates to managing existing performing loans, not from origination, not only from origination, but through performance and then all in all into delinquency and default. And as I'd mentioned, um, you know, the uh, the ability to manage those loans forbearance programs, uh, modifications, workouts, uh, all those types of things are much more sophisticated than we were back in the two, early 2000s. But the other side of it, you mentioned, you know, um, uh, the expectation in terms of speed and, and um, the occurrence is that 
back in the early 2000s, we had just an absolutely um, huge rise in foreclosures in a very short period of time. Most of the individuals I speak to uh, in the industry are, are not expecting that to happen this time. We will have an increase as we we're talking about, but I think it's going to be just a little bit more of a slower burn. Okay. Um, and so instead of happening within a year, it's probably going to happen with more than within like two years, maybe two and a half years. Uh, so it does allow servicers and lenders to be able to prepare and obviously, uh, you know, create the, those uh, types of resources, those types of tools to manage uh, delinquencies, defaults, and foreclosure activities. So that's a big help. Okay. But so, so my, let me let so, me ask you sure. then, what what kind of strategic planning should lenders be doing with that with that uh, outlook, and that it would be a slow roll? What kind of strategic planning should lenders be doing today to prepare for what's on the horizon? I mean, our industry is notorious, not just lenders, but servicers, subservicers. Our, lend, our industry is notoriously heads down on reacting to the news of today, maybe looking two to three days ahead with some light strategic planning. So what do folks need to do today to pretend to prepare for this slow rise while tempering how much time and effort they invest into their strategy as things could change fairly quickly. I mean, that's, that's the challenge of our industry is that things change so quickly. So how much do I invest in strategic planning for tomorrow, knowing that, you know, while I'm, I'm aiming for point A, I may end up at point B, uh it, so how how does a lender balance that michael what, what what kind of strategic planning do they do today so i think really it comes down to kind of three tranches one is is looking at what type of resources you have in the default um section of your of your uh, company the other is looking at what types of policies and procedures you have in place to make sure that you are compliant and lastly is how are you going to manage your reporting, your borrower outreach, et cetera. So let me take a little bit deeper dive if you don't mind. Please. One is, is that, and it relates to resource allocation, obviously many resources within an organization has been supplied towards origination for obvious reasons and not so much in default. And it was very similar to what happened back in the early 2000s. The same kind of shift happened, it just happened much more quickly as we just mentioned where servicers had to quickly shift and move resources into default and were caught a little bit behind the curve. And we saw the outcome of that. Uh, this time around, as we just talked about, I think there's a little bit of a slow burn. So the ability to be able to reallocate resources. When I say resources, it's personnel, it's expertise. And I talk about personnel, personnel and expertise. Do we have the right people in the default seats? Are you going to just repurpose those individuals that have been focused on origination and, and repurpose and retrain them for default? Are you going to bring new people in to manage those default activities, uh, borrow outreach, outreach, all the loss mitigation um, associated processes um, and you know, borrower contact, et cetera? or maybe even outsource those activities, looking for third parties. Is that more cost beneficial to your organization as opposed to uh, training and rebuilding within? Uh, the second, when I talk about expertise, do you have the right people in the organization that understand the process, understand the compli uh, compliance requirements? Do you have a compliance team? Uh, do you uh, keep, keep up with compliance and regulatory requirements? And those are really big factors in terms of making sure you're maintaining the right processes, policies, and procedures in your organization, not only to be effective and efficient for yourself, but obviously for your borrower as well. And from that perspective, how do you make sure? How do you check yourself and making sure that you have all these things, these checks and balances in place? And it's not, you know, it starts with delinquency, getting in front of it, getting in touch with the borrower, making sure you're in communication with the borrower, make sure you have the right documentation, et cetera. But then moving into default, what are your workout activities? What are your options there? Do you have a, a nice suite of options for, for the borrower to make sure they don't get into serious trouble and being able to obtain, retain or retain, make that loan become re-performing? And then lastly, if you get into late stage default and there's no coming out, well, how are you going to manage your foreclosure action? And what is your strategy for closure? Uh, when you come back and how are you going to manage the, the collateral, the real property? 
from an inspection, from a maintenance, from uh, resale, um, you know, the actual trustee sale, which your bidding process, there's all sorts of nuances related to this that create tremendous amount of losses for lenders and, um, and for services and, and obviously for the borrower. That's really good. Uh, those are really valuable points, Michael, as to what what kind of fine tuning and, and uh, strategic planning they, guidance uh, that that folks need today. Let me let, uh, tremendous insights. Thank you. Um, my my. Let me ask you. Is there anything they should be uh, afraid of when it comes to the CFPB? I mean, is the CFPB some something that should be on the radar in their strategic planning, being worried about kind of audits, or is CFPB's focus somewhere else? Uh, and they don't need to be as necessarily worried about, uh, you know, them coming and tapping them on the shoulder for a quick audit and, you know, to make sure that their policies and procedures are in place and, and that they're servicing the customer accordingly or, uh, it, it, you know, is that a legitimate concern right now? So that's a great question, Keith, and allow me to respond is that, you know, I don't think the CFPB is a threat. I think you need to embrace it as your friend. CFPB is there for a reason. It's to keep everybody in check. It's to protect the borrower and it's to protect the lending institution as well. And so from that perspective, I do think that CFPB, as we're talking about, the CFP will shift their um, their microscope from origination to servicing and now back into default. And as things will fall out when they find that they are th there are activities with the default that maybe they need to tighten down, they will come up with new regulations. They will change some of the requirements and you need to be ahead of that or at least abreast and in tune with that and understanding how you need to adjust your policies and procedures to make sure you are in compliance. Um, so, you know, again, as you shift and as the industry shifts from origination to default, so will CFPB. But again, I really believe the best practice is to embrace CFPB as a partnership in maintaining your relationship with your borrower. That's good. Very good perspective. Thank you. I was absolutely curious of that uh, as to how people should be looking at CFPB. And I, I like your your point that they should be seen more as a friend and not a uh, foe and really plan accordingly uh, just to make sure that you, you have your ducks in a row. So CFPB actually is a good tool to hold yourself accountable. Uh, and the more preparation you can do beforehand, the, the less risk you have of having to defend open items or issues or misses. So well doing said. the gap, I'm sorry? No, so well said. No, absolutely spot on. And, and so from that perspective, it does give you a sounding board or a template um, for you to you know manage your internal practices accordingly. Cool, cool. So we've talked about where the industry's at. We've talked about what strategic planning needs to be done today for what's ahead. What would you say are some of the key action items that servicing leaders should be looking at to ensure that their proper tools, that they have the proper tools and are uh, process ha have the right process for loss mitigation and default resolution? So I put, I personally believe there's a couple of benchmarks. Uh, um, CFPB requirements are is a great tool. And make sure, obviously, if you're in compliant, that's that's imperative. But the other is looking at uh, GSCs, looking at Fannie and Freddie requirements. They're always a great sounding board, and making sure that you may have your best practices. But the other side of it is, you know, default requires a fairly significant amount of vendor management, third party vendor management. So not only looking at your policies and procedures. Uh, internally, but looking at your best practices, the way you're managing third third party business partners. Um, so, you know, there are things uh, related to loss mitigation, obviously borrower out, outreach um, and debt collection, inspection, uh, again, managing your actual physical collateral, uh, the actual property itself and in situations where you maybe have a tax lien uh, take back or you have a notice of abandonment, something like that, making sure that you inspect and secure assets. Those all require, you know, uh, valuation, title searches. Those are all things that require third party actions that you have to partner with. So obviously, if you have the internal resources or do you have the re internal resources to manage those third party partners accordingly? and making sure that you are as efficient as possible in managing that. And a key component of that obviously is documentation reporting. And so making sure that you have all that in place. 
Now the question is, do you have the right people in room to make sure that you do have all those things in place? Mm -hmm. Or do you maybe have to bring somebody in as a consultant or as a contractor to come in and take as a third party to come in and look at your processes? Kind of from the outside looking in is always never, or for me, never a bad practice to have a second set of eyes on looking at it. Sometimes as an operational leader, we might get too close to it and not realize where our risks are. We all know <laughs> that, correct? So the, the, the ability to have somebody come in and look at it. But the other thing related to third party activities is related to technology. Obviously, a lot of this relates around technology. Whatever um, um, loan servicing tool you utilize and the subsequent bolt on uh, technologies related to, again, origination, uh, performing, non performing, delinquency, default, foreclosure. Are you leveraging those technologies to the best of your ability? Do you have the right uh, pieces within that talk technology to make sure that you're efficient and you're compliant? That's good. That's really good. You know, we talk about these things in in, in just in small little micro bites as we engage. You know, since you stepped into Barkman, but to have this real one-on-one -on -one conversation around you know, these critical components, uh, it, it, it kind of brings everything into full focus for me. Uh, I really can fully appreciate now the 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 servicing assessment, the two week servicing assessment offering that you have and, and how all these all of the things that you cover in your two week servicing assessment, it really have been itemized in 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 this particular call. Uh, that that you take a good hard look at each of those, and now it just comes full circle and really laser uh, uh, focus for me now. All these moving parts that you've been talking about for months. So I appreciate this, Michael. It's been amazing discussion. I have a feeling we're going to be able to go deeper and wider on a lot of these components in future podcasts. So I'm looking forward to those discussions. Um, folks, just again, great advice from Michael. I generally don't try to go beyond three questions. Uh, otherwise, you know, we found that some folks get bit uh, by the in the shark tank uh, if we're in here too long. Uh, so we'll take it in small uh, bits and pieces. But um, uh, it sounds like, you know, to recap right now, it's a little bit like a calm before the storm in servicing and in default servicing. There won't be a tsunami like we saw, as you said, back between 2003 and 2010. But if servicers aren't analyzing their organization from top to bottom, they don't know where the gaps are now or how to prepare for them to scale uh, as the trends uh, continue to point that we're gonna have uh, more challenges in the default servicing space. So uh, great insights, Michael, good, good stuff. Uh, folks, if you haven't read Michael's recent blog, uh, just recently released called Lender Defaults Ahead, uh, are you prepared? I encourage you to go to the blog part of our website at blackfin-group.com and read it. Uh, it's a great, great article uh, from Michael. Great insights and great recommendations. Also, if you want to learn how Michael and his team are helping lenders and servicers with their quick servicing uh, assessments, uh, or basically provide you with a servicing and default servicing health check, uh, you can email us at info at blackfin-group.com. Michael, thank you for being with us today. Great time in the shark cage. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it, Keith, as well, and I look forward to additional conversations as this industry devolves, evolves. We'll learn more and more about, you know, potential needs and risks and, uh, and be uh, great for future conversation. Excellent. Look forward to it. Folks, until next time, this has been another exciting episode in the Shark Cage. We'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for joining us in the Shark Cage. To be a guest on a future episode, send an email to info at blackfin-group.com. To find out more about the show or the information provided in this episode, visit Blackfin Group online at www.blackfin-group.com.